Hi and welcome to the channel. The brand new Nikon Z8 is an amazing camera, but it's not the easiest to set up, especially when it comes to the autofocus, it can be tricky to master. So in this video, I'm going to share the most important settings that will allow you to take amazing and razor sharp images with your own Z8. And all these settings will actually also apply to the Z9 because both of these cameras are very similar and except for a few small changes, I set up both cameras exactly the same way. If you're a bit more old school, don't like to stop and start a video and want to know every single setting that I've set up on the Z8, I've also linked a PDF guide for you down there in the description that will allow you to read through all my settings and not having to stop and start this video, for instance. So if you prefer that, check it out in the description. To get the best results with the Z8 and Z9 for that matter, it's important that we use different autofocusing modes and assign them to different buttons and sometimes hand over from one autofocusing mode to another one that has given me the best results in the field. I've actually assigned three different autofocusing modes to three different buttons. Personally, I also like full back button autofocus, so I've disabled the focusing on the shutter button and only focus with some of the buttons on the rear or the front of the camera. To not have this video too long, I will not discuss every single menu item, but I will scroll through them so you see how I've set them up, because a lot of these are just personal preference. So if you want to see every single item, check out the PDF guide, but I'm sure with this video you will also be able to set up your camera in a way that will give you amazing results. So let's jump right in. I'm going to go through the menu top to bottom, so we're going to start with the yellow photo shooting menu. In this first menu, we can set up a few different things, for instance, our storage folder names. And if you want personalized file names, for instance, you can also change it here where it says file naming. Then we also have the primary card slot selection and the function for the secondary card slot. The primary card slot, obviously, I said that the CF Express card, the fastest card. And for the second slot, an SD card in the case of the Z8, I select to use it as an overflow. I don't really like to do redundant shooting when I have a faster and a slower card, and I never had a CF Express card fail. So I prefer to set the second card, the SD card, to overflow. So whenever my first card is full, the camera doesn't stop shooting, but instantly continues shooting on the second card. Another menu item is the image area. Here we can select if we want to shoot in FX mode, which gives you the full sensor size, or DX the crop mode, which will give you a 1.5 crop. Another important point here is also the raw recording, where we can select either lossless compression or a slightly lower quality, but still great high efficiency compression that still gives us great files with smaller file sizes, which allows you also to have bigger buffer sizes. So this comes down to personal preference. I usually use lossless, but I also had great results with the high efficiency rules. Setting up the white balance, I found a little bit tricky on the Z8 and the Z9, and I ended up using the auto white balance and I set it to auto two and then I select keep warm lighting colors, which gives me the nicest results in sort of real shady dark scenarios. It's still too blue, but in most other cases, it gives me pretty good results. From here on out, I haven't changed too much. I select my color space for Adobe RGB, but you can also change that afterwards. So it doesn't really matter. And then I've turned off any of the noise reductions in camera, the, the diffraction control, the vignette control, all of this usually only affects the JPEG file anyways, and if anything, it might slow down the camera a little bit, so I turn all these off. There's one interesting point to skin softening. If you're shooting a video, for instance, or photos, you can turn on the skin softening, and it will allow you to select a different sort of strength of skin softening, which can be interesting if you don't want to do too much editing. Personally, I prefer to kind of deal with that in post-production, but it's definitely an interesting feature. Everything else here I've turned off again and the metering I just left to evaluative metering, but I always shoot in full manual mode, so the metering mode really doesn't have any effect. An important point here now is the AF area mode. We set up a few more AF modes later on, but here I set the first base autofocusing mode. And I want to set that to the largest custom white area. And I'm using this white area to find the bird for me. And once I find the bird, I'd hand it over to the 3D tracking, which we will sign up later. So my aim is to have a very large custom white area box that then finds the bird for me, puts a little gray box onto the bird, and then basically sort of tracks it for me, even when I don't press any of the buttons. And whenever I press the rear button, in my case, it will be the AF on button, then tracking starts to take over from that point that the AF area has already found for me. So for instance, I have the AF area on the bird, it finds the bird's head with the gray box, I press the 3D tracking, which we will assign later, and I get perfect tracking and a perfect handover between the two modes. Using a custom white area for finding the birds and kind of as my base autofocusing mode has given me the best results in the field. 
For perch birds, I like a big white area, and for birds in flight, actually a sort of smaller, narrower area has given me some better results. So you might have to switch between the sizes of the boxes depending on what you're shooting. So to set that up, we go into the menu, go to the custom white area, and then select the largest, widest box, 19 by 11, and press OK. Next, we can set the subject detection. You can either set it to order or animals. I usually like to set it to animal in case there's some different things in my picture, for instance, people and animals. I don't want it to have to guess between what I'm focusing on, but basically whatever subject you're shooting, you want to set it to. Next, what's also very important is the vibration reduction. I like to set it to on under normal mode. There is sports mode, but I find sports mode to be a little bit sort of hectic and jerky, unless you're moving your camera a lot. If you move it a lot, it seems to work well, but I've definitely had the best results on the normal mode. Everything else in this menu I've pretty much turned off again. Now that we've set up the camera to take great photos, we should also learn to edit these images. So if you're not quite sure to get the absolute most out of your raw files and make them look amazing, I would really like to help you with my masterclass and my pro sets that are linked for you down there in the description. I know that will help you tremendously to take your images to the next level. With my pro sets, I enable you with just one click to transform your raw files into a great starting point for the editing process. And in my masterclass, I teach you step by step everything you need to know about Photoshop and things like cloning, how to remove things, color correction, and just simply how to make your images look all around amazing. Onto the video menu, and here the Z8 offers us some fantastic features like internal ProRes recording, and this is the first thing I set up. I like my file format to be ProRes because I get beautiful files that are also very easy to edit, even on sort of slower computers. The file size is pretty big, but the quality and the ease of editing is why I choose them. So I like to select ProRes 422 10-bit, and I also like to shoot in log format, which gives me very low contrast picture with high dynamic range. You can choose SDR, which will give you contrast in your files, but then you have less dynamic range. If you're shooting log, you have to be aware that you have to edit the files a lot to get them the color and the contrast back, but I would recommend using log if you can, because you'll get better dynamic range and better results overall, unless you don't want to do much editing, then shooting in a sort of standard profile is the better choice. When it comes to the frame rate, I like to shoot at 25 frames per second because I'm a PAL country. If you're in an NTSC country, you might want to shoot at 30 frames per second. Because for instance, if I'm in here and I'm shooting with the wrong frame rate, the lights might look like they're flickering. So I just stick to what is the standard in my country, which in my case is 4K 25 frames per second. There's also a lot of other frame rates available, like 120 frames per second, but I personally don't like to shoot too much slow motion, prefer to have sort of have that natural movement in my bird videos. And then I set the video quality and raw to high, and I activate extended oversampling as well to get some better image quality. And now this one is important, the video autofocus. With the Z8 and the Z9, I had the best results when I just let the camera find my subject and track it all over the viewfinder. So to set that up, I go to the focus mode and I select AFF full-time autofocus. And when it comes to the AF area mode, I select the auto area AF. So the camera has the whole viewfinder, whole area to focus on and find the subject. And that tracking works very well. Subject to detect, I set it to whichever subject I want again. And the vibration reduction, I have the same as photo. I turn off the electronic VR and leave the microphone sensitivity to auto. And I did turn on the wind noise reduction. Another interesting point here is the high res zoom. This allows you to actually zoom in to your video without losing quality because basically you're starting off with an 8K file and then zooming in to 4K. So you're basically zooming in with a two times zoom into your video file and still end up with a nice 4K file. So this can be quite interesting. The only sort of struggle I had with it in the field is that not all video autofocusing modes seem to be available. So it's a little bit harder to keep focus on the bird because for instance, the full auto area that I was using wasn't available anymore when I was in the high res zoom mode. So I didn't use it all the time, but it can be quite a cool feature because you can assign it to one of the function rings on your lens and then slowly zoom into your file, for instance, like on this feeding Osprey, which was a really cool feature and something I would definitely use from time to time. Okay, so now it gets interesting because we go to the custom menus, the focusing and where we're gonna set up all our buttons. The first interesting one here is the focus tracking with lock on. I set the block shot autofocus response to three. 
I've tried five in the past, I've tried some other settings, but three seem to give me the best results lately. And then I also set the subject motion to steady. A lot of people think that a bird is very erratic when it moves around, but if we're honest, we're looking at the bird even when it's flying, unless it's some tiny swallow or something, the behavior in terms of autofocus is actually pretty sort of steady. So I had the better results setting it to steady. The next one I'm setting up here is the store points by orientation. And I set it up that it remembers the focus point, but not the area mode. So if I go from vertical to horizontal, it will remember which point I use, but it doesn't change the area mode. So the next interesting point here is the AF activation. This tells us how you focus on the camera. I personally like back button autofocus, so I set it to AF on only, which means only what the AF on button or whichever other button I assign it to in the custom menu will be used for focusing and the shutter button will only meter and tag the images. I'm setting the focus point of persistence to auto. If you're doing some manual focus, you can also set up focus peaking in this menu, for instance. So whenever you turn the manual focus ring, you will see, for instance, like a blue color that shows you which areas of the image are in focus. Then I set the focus point selection speed to high. And this one is also an important one, the manual focus ring in autofocus mode, and I turn that on. That means that whenever you turn the manual focus ring, it will focus. The rest are left pretty much all the standard settings. When it comes to the power off delay, I personally like the camera to stay on and only turn off when I turn it off because it can be quite annoying if it just turns off when you wanted to take an image, for instance. But this really comes down to personal preference and how many spare batteries you have. So if you only have a few batteries, you might want to have set the turning off timer to a shorter period of time. But personally, I just set it to like five minutes. So whenever I leave the camera in my backpack, it will turn off automatically in case I forget to turn it off. But it won't really turn off while I'm shooting. When it comes to the continuous shooting speed, obviously set it to the highest possible 20 frames per second. And then here you can also select what frame rate you want to have on some of the lower shooting speeds, which is really cool because you can go from 10 all the way down to 1. In this blue shooting slash display menu, we can also set our pre-burst settings. This is a cool feature. So whenever you half press the shutter button, the camera will already start recording images for you even before you fully press the button. So for instance, if a bird's taking off and you may have missed a shot, in this case, you will not miss the shot. So this is a cool feature and you can set it up and play around with it here. However, it's only available in JPEG. So personally, I don't use it, but it's still a pretty cool feature. Everything else are pretty much left the same. And one important one in the view mode in the viewfinder is that you show the effects of the settings. If you like a grid or virtual horizon, this is also the menu where you can set these up. What's important in this menu, here we can also select what we see on the rear screen and in the viewfinder. If we go to custom monitor shooting display or custom viewfinder shooting display, it will give you options of what you see in your viewfinder and you can customize it. For instance, I don't like to see too much, but what I definitely like to see is the histogram, for instance. So I turn off a lot of the things that I don't want to see, but I activate the histogram. So I have my autofocus point showing, I have the histogram showing. In this menu, I also activate the high frames per second viewfinder because it gives me a smoother, nicer to look at picture in the EVF. I didn't change anything in the flash menu. And now we're coming to the custom settings menu where we set up all the different back button autofocusing. So this is quite important. We've already disabled the shutter button focusing. So now we need to enable the 3D tracking on the AF on button and also assign the focusing for the wide area to the display button. And I also want to assign the spot autofocusing to the front function button number one. Of course, there's many different ways to set up the camera, and I'm not claiming this is the only way, but this has worked very well for me in the field. If you prefer shutter button autofocusing, you could also set up the camera in a way that, for instance, the wide area custom focuses with the shutter button, and the 3D tracking is just on the AF on button, for instance, if that's easier for you. So when we go into the custom shooting controls, the very first icon is the function button number one. We click on that, we click to the right, we navigate to AF area mode and AF on, and in there we select single autofocusing point and press OK. And now we've set up spot autofocusing to the function button number one. So whenever we press and hold that button, the camera will show us that one tiny autofocusing field that, can we, that we can move all over the viewfinder and focus on one specific spot. So for instance, if the tracking sort of autofocus doesn't find your subject well or focuses on the background, you can press the function button number one and focus right back onto the bird or on something close to you. Next, we want to assign the AF on button. So we navigate to the AF on button. 
go to AF area mode and AF on, and then I select 3D tracking because 3D tracking, especially for perch birds, has given me the best results. When it comes to birds in flight, like my ospreys that I showed you in my Z8 review, I had better results actually using a wide area, sort of smaller, narrower wide area, and actually using the focusing for the wide area as well instead of the 3D tracking. But in most cases, using the large wide area to find a bird and then handing over to the 3D tracking is giving me the best results. Just in the rare case, it's like the flying osprey against the busy background, a different sort of setup of autofocusing has worked better. So in certain scenarios, you'll just have to play around with the different modes to find what works best. And lastly, I want to assign the focusing for the wide area custom to the display button. So if we navigate to the display button, go to AF area mode and AF on, and then select wide area custom. So now whenever I press the display button, the focusing will be activated for the large custom wide area. That's our base autofocusing mode. If I press the AF on button, 3D tracking will be activated. And if I press the function button number one, single point autofocus will be activated. And of course, I also have manual focus available on the lens ring. When it comes to the video custom controls, I didn't change much except that I like to be able to activate filming and stop filming with the shutter button. So I just set that to record movies and stop movies. When it comes to the autofocus speed and tracking sensitivity, I've left the standard settings because they've given me good results in the field, so I didn't really feel the need to make any changes there. If you have activated the high res zoom that allows you to zoom into your videos, here you can also select how fast you want that zoom to go in, whether it's zoop or very slowly. Then you can see I turned a few things off or left them the same. And then we can also select our zebra C, which is very helpful for video. So I go into the menu, set the sensitivity, select the pattern, and I also select the color in here. So whenever there's something that is out blown out, it will show on the back of the camera now and allows me to then make changes to the shutter speed or ISO for instance, so it's not blown out anymore. And most other things in that menu are left untouched. When we go to the playback menu, there's a few interesting things here. One is where you can select whichever things you want to show when you're looking back at your images. So if you go to the playback display options, you can tick a lot of different boxes of what you want to actually see displayed on the rear screen. I don't like too much information, so I just select a couple of things like the histogram. In the yellow setup menu, I left most things untouched, but there's a few important ones we should change. The first one is the safe focus position. If this is not activated, every time the camera goes to standby or turns off, it will lose focus and everything will be defocused. Whereas if we turn this on, the camera will remember the last position it focused on. So if you focus on a perch, for instance, it will not be fully defocused, but still focused on the perch. So I think this is very important. The only reason to not have this activated is if you have lenses that automatically zoom in or out when you're using them, because they might be damaged if this is activated. But for all other lenses, I would highly recommend to turn this on so the camera remembers the focus position. And here I've also set the auto temperature cut out too high. So if you're filming or the camera gets too hot, it gives me a higher threshold before the camera turns off. This may damage the camera in the long run. I don't think so. But it's, to me, it's more important that it doesn't cut out when I want to film. So I have set to high. But in saying that, I never had any of these issues in the first place. Here we can also set the sensor shield behavior at power off. The normal setting is already on. So it means whenever you turn off the camera, the shield will go down. And that's the setting I would recommend. And another interesting one is the camera sounds here, where we can select how loud the shutter sound is, if we want any shutter sound, if you want some beeps. So here you can just select whichever preference you have. I usually either have a completely silent or very quiet shutter sound. You can also select silent mode in this menu, but this means that the camera will not make any sounds. And I believe it will also then not put down the shutter shield when you turn off the camera. So silent mode is really only useful if you're like, in a quiet church and you need to take some images and not make any sound at all. And lastly, in this menu, what's quite useful, especially for me who keeps getting like a Z8 or Z9 from Nikon, I have to give it back. In this menu point, we can save and load our settings. So whenever I get a camera and set it up properly, I save these settings onto memory card. And when I get another camera from Nikon, I can just load these settings onto that camera and it can go with the right settings in one second, basically. Otherwise, I would have to change all these settings manually, which would take me forever. So being able to save and load the settings here is very important and something that I would do frequently. So whenever you somehow lose your settings or reset your camera, you have your settings available. And now we're already through the menu. That's not too difficult to set up, is it? 
The Z8 is an amazing camera and I know you will get some fantastic images with it, but it's not the easiest, especially when it comes to setting up the autofocus. So my method of using the wide area custom with the largest possible box to find the bird and then hand it over to the 3D tracking to track the bird has given me the best results, especially for perch birds. So I hope you will experience the same and get some fantastic results. I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments how you've set up your Z8 or how you're going with it in general and what results you're getting. Also make sure to check out the PDF guide if you want to see all my settings and all written out. And also give me a thumbs up for the video and hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video very soon. Bye!